the hundreds of, of engineering hours that went behind this and the records of those designs. The entire world watched when a stopwatch was put over the impending deaths of five passengers of the Ocean Gate submarine. As the vessel was lost in the vastness and the depth of the ocean, the sub was reported to have only 96 hours of oxygen supply give and take. In a bleak move, many news channels and social media pages were running a live countdown of the wishful 96 hours, and as the clock hit zero, all rescue missions were halted and ceased as the notorious Ocean Gate expeditions made the unfortunate statement on the deaths of all five passengers, including the company's CEO, Stockton Rush. All things considered, the rescue mission was a race against time. And now, emerging reports suggest that the game was rigged from the very start. The poor conditions of the submarine, as well as a blatant disregard for the safety protocols, had doomed the submarine way before it had begun its expedition. In a case where you can contaminate someone else, it's not about you. It's about the collective You're assuming. health. Not to mention the conditions around the rescue mission were incredibly hard as well. The rescuers were concerned that the sub would run out of oxygen before the designated 96 hours given the number of passengers. And as many news reports were relentlessly reporting that the rescue mission also had the same number of hours to locate the missing submarine, experts had to chime in. According to submarine and Titanic expedition experts, the rescuers had roughly 76 hours to locate the missing Ocean Gate vessel. Even then, the odds of finding the passengers alive were pretty slim. As diabolical as it sounds, the passengers had no way out, sure. Any human attempting to swim four kilometers below the ocean surface would be crushed under the oceanic pressure, but humans are prone to fight for their survival, right? Believe it or not, the five passengers were bolted inside the submarine. This means that the gate of the vessel could only be opened from the outside. It's not hard to figure out what that means. Even if the submarine was located on the ocean bed with the passengers alive, rescue operations by U.S. Coastal Guards were essentially powerless. Considering the depth of the ocean, the submarine would have been stuck in the muddy oceanic floor, making it immovable and inaccessible. So, naturally, we would have no choice but to leave the passengers right where they were found. Tim Malton, an expert on the Titanic's sinking and wreckage, wasn't optimistic about the rescue missions either. Since Malton has a fair and accurate idea about the location of the ship's wreckage, he was able to give more realistic insights about the missing submarine. He suggested that given the sub's poor design and oceanic pressure, the vessel was more likely to be breached and water must have found its way inside. In his own words, it's pitch black down there. It's freezing cold. The seabed is mud and it's undulating. You can't see your hand in front of your face. Finding the submarine was already finding a needle in a haystack situation. And what made matters worse was the fact that the submersibles couldn't have towed the missing submarine to the surface of the ocean. That was just technologically impossible. Embedded vessels on the ocean floor are a tricky maneuver. Plus, as experts were citing relentlessly, we have more idea about the surface of the moon than our ocean surface. Perhaps this is why many experts on the Titanic wreckage were calling the rescue mission wishful thinking or a hoax. As OceanGate released the submarine into the depths of the ocean, it had an idea that if anything goes south, there won't be any coming back. The company had made sure that all the passengers signed the liability waivers not once, not twice, but many, many times. Now that might seem just a protocol, but the company was notoriously risky and had little regard for robust safety protocols. Did OceanGate send its passengers into the ocean only to leave them high and dry? It looks like it. But there's more. In a recent uncovering by the New York Times, a letter from 2018 written by industry experts has shed light on major concerns surrounding the Titan submersible and its planned expeditions to the Titanic wreckage. The letter, penned by the Marine Technology Society, a group of ocean engineers, technologists, policymakers, and educators, straight up criticized OceanGate, the company behind the Titan, for their experimental approach and lack of independent assessment from industry regulators. The heart of the matter lies in the question of whether the Titan should have undergone evaluation by industry assessors or risk regulators. The Marine Technology Society expressed dissatisfaction with OceanGate's claims that the Titan design would meet or surpass safety standards established by DNVGL, a highly regarded classification society for the maritime industry. 
but it has now become apparent that Ocean Gate had no intention of subjecting the vessel to assessment by the same organization. It was a surprising twist to say the least. The DNV certification process typically involves comprehensive inspections during construction and operations to ensure compliance with internationally recognized rules. In an interview with The Guardian, which never saw the light of day, Stockton Rush, CEO of OceanGate, divulged intriguing details about the Titan. Rush described it as a custom-built vessel capable of closely observing the Titanic wreckage. He boasted about the Titan's lighter weight and enhanced maneuverability compared to other submersibles, enabling it to venture perilously close to the wreck. What's more, he also acknowledged the inherent dangers associated with the expeditions, such as unpredictable underwater currents and the absence of a reliable tracking system. The enigmatic nature of these revelations adds a sense of intrigue. OceanGate later addressed their decision not to pursue certification for the Titan in a blog post. They argued that while certification ensures adherence to standards, it fails to sufficiently address the primary cause of accidents human error. They also shared concerns that the certification process could stifle innovation and impede progress for many of us. The current status of industry certification for the Titan remains shrouded in mystery, but a CBS News reporter scheduled to embark on the vessel in 2022 revealed that the waiver he signed explicitly stated the experimental nature of the Titan and its lack of approval or certification from any regulatory body. Years before to this tragedy, OceanGate faced allegations of neglecting proper safety protocols and disregarding proper testing. External reviewers, as well as the company's own employees and engineers, expressed doubts about the submarine's ability to withstand the immense pressure of the ocean depths. Every aspect, from the construction materials to the submarine's emergency exit mechanism, was deemed suspicious and unreliable. It seemed that the driving force behind the operational expeditions was OceanGate's executive officer and founder, Stockton Rush. Behind closed doors, OceanGate also experienced internal strife before making their expeditions public. David Lockridge, OceanGate's director of marine operations, conducted multiple tests on the submersible's capacity to endure high pressures and extreme depths. The results were far from optimistic. In fact, Lockridge was extremely concerned about the submarine's readiness, fearing that those on board would embark on a one-way trip or will face a lot of trouble when attempting to resurface. When Lockridge raised his concerns with the company's management and CEO, he found himself strategically silenced. In response, OceanGate filed a lawsuit in the U.S. District Court in Seattle, accusing David Lockridge of defaming the company and breaching a non-disclosure agreement. In retaliation, Lockridge countersued, claiming wrongful termination from his position due to his justified questioning of the submersible's testing protocols. This legal battle thrust OceanGate's safety protocols into the spotlight. But the case was ultimately resolved under confidential terms, leaving the outcome of Lockridge's explosive report shrouded in secrecy. We wonder why. The revelations surrounding the Titan submersible present a web of intrigue raising significant questions about safety, regulation, and the delicate balance between innovation and adherence to industry standards in the realm of commercial submersibles. What lies beneath the surface remains an enigma, but the implications are profound. Obviously, the report is pretty useful in gauging why the tragedy happened in the first place. All things considered, it seems like OceanGate knew that its safety was subpar at best and it is not hard to see why the company proceeded with its operation despite a plethora of warning signs. First things first, as per OceanGate's own confession, the craft was eligible to reach the depth of four kilometers where the wreckage of Titanic is resting. And well, now we know that's obviously not the case. One could actually argue that we already knew about the submersive being highly unreliable if only we had read Lockridge's report. In the report, he had specified that the passenger viewport was only safe for depths of 1300 meters or 1.3 kilometers. And to be fair, OceanGate could have a passenger viewport of 4000 meters or 4 kilometers to make the expedition safe to view the Titanic wreckage. If that would have happened, all five passengers would have made their journey back home. But then, what went wrong? As per Lockridge, OceanGate refused to pay for the safest passenger viewport that would have ensured the reliability of the submarine to handle the extreme depth. Yet everything went down the drain when the company decided to minimize the spending on manufacturing costs. 
Carbon fibre is used in airplanes and yachts, but not for deep sea vessels. It's extremely strong, but questions have been raised about its reliability under extreme pressures. While the ticket price of the expedition was pretty high, a price tag of 250,000 US dollars had to be justified through safety protocols, right? OceanGate didn't pay heed to any of that. Even though the company received another warning in 2018 from the Marine Technology Society, a professional group of ocean engineers, technologists, policymakers, and educators. In their open letter, they talked about how submersive enthusiasts and experts were worried that the current experimental approach adopted by OceanGate could result in negative outcomes, from minor to huge, that would have serious consequences for everyone in the industry. While these issues seem theoretical and only emerged in the testing phase, the company also had run into major issues in their earlier expeditions. And instead of shutting off the program or investing in better submersibles and safety protocols, OceanGate kept sending Titan to extreme depths that the submarine wasn't designed to withstand. Josh Gates, the known host of the TV show Expedition Unknown, also had a terrible experience at the Titan. Gates had taken his chances with the submersive when it was making its maiden voyage to experience the mighty wrecked ship that lies 3.8 kilometers below the surface of the North Atlantic Ocean. That's when the host witnessed the cause for alarm in the flesh. The Titan had major issues with the thruster control. In his own words, we had issues with the computers aboard. We had issues with comms. I just felt as though the sub needed more time and it needed more testing, frankly. And before you ask, yeah, those concerns didn't go unnoticed by the Ocean Gate management. Even then, the Titan proceeded to make its voyage. Plus, Gates is not the only passenger who made similar grave comments about the sub's safety protocol. You might have seen The Simpsons foreshadowing the tragedy. The snippet of that particular scene has been making rounds on social media for quite a while now. So it's almost jarring and bizarre that Mike Rice, a comedy writer for the show, also experienced communication failures in his expeditions with OceanGate. One of the trips was to the Titanic. While talking to ABC News, he said that he has taken four dives with the company, and every single time their vessel was left stranded in the mission. More explosive criticism came from James Cameron, the director of the blockbuster film Titanic, as well as an expert deep ocean researcher. According to him, the Titan's design had a fundamental flaw that wasn't catered to in its earlier voyages and test dives. While OceanGate got the mainstream spotlight from the public due to the recent tragedy, the deep submergence community already criticized the company for its irresponsible designs. Yet the CEO kept dodging the criticisms and pushed a lot of cases of complaints under the rug. In the words of James Cameron himself, and a number of the top players in the deep submergence engineering community even wrote letters to the company saying that what they were doing was too experimental to carry passengers and it needed to be certified and so on. Yet the company didn't halt its actions yet again. The main criticism had been drawn to Rush, the executive officer of the company for being dismissive of the expert reports and failed safety checks. Very publicly, he had admitted that standardized security tests are a big hurdle in technological innovation. Sounds diabolical, right? For years, Rush had maintained that expert opinions who seem to scrutinize the expeditions are out of place and don't seem to hold any relevance. In his own blog post, he cited, bringing an outside entity up to speed on every innovation before it is put into real-world testing is anathema to rapid innovation. Technically, he wasn't in favor of bringing an outsider to dismantle the process of his creation. Call it sheer narcissism or warranted confidence in an extraordinary venture, the facts don't seem to lie. Sure, there's no denying that OceanGate was doing something unique and fascinating. Many Titanic enthusiasts have expressed the desire to watch leftovers of the mighty vessel that became seaborne during its maiden expedition. Yet those opportunities were only reserved for expert researchers and explorers that were studying the ship closely. Of course, my submersive missions were also initiated to recover the wreckage of the Titanic, and that was one hefty process. Such voyages taught us that despite our sheer interest in the sunken vessel, the journey to the wreckage site is incredibly difficult and risky. And while it made sense for experts to take a dip into the extreme depths of the oceans, making it a public venture was just a means of earning no matter what the safety protocols. Not to mention, expeditions that had taken care of safety concerns right to the T also faced severe issues. But this is not all. This is not a standard construction submersible. Normally, they'd be constructed out of either a high-strength steel or a titanium. 
Something similar happened in 2000 that could have foreshadowed the great tragedy, and Neil deGrasse Tyson wants everyone to know. So there's this US journalist named Michael Gillen who recently shared his terrifying experience of being trapped in a deep sea submersible in the same spot where a tourist submersible went missing near the Titanic wreck. Back in 2000, Gillen was the first correspondent ever to report from the Titanic wreckage, so you can imagine his excitement. During the dive, Gillen, his diving partner Brian, and Russian pilot Victor were exploring the Titanic in a small Russian submersible that was lowered from a research ship. They had already toured the bow of the ship without any issues and decided to head toward the stern, which was further away. As they approached the deeper area, they found themselves caught in a powerful underwater current. Tyson shared that the submersible ended up getting stuck in the propeller, and that's when things took a terrifying turn. Debris from the Titanic started falling on top of them, huge rusted chunks that made them realize they were in serious trouble. Look, it's straight ahead of us, Brian. Straight ahead of us. Wow. It's huge. Guillen vividly remembers the moment they got stuck, and the pilot, Victor, who had experience flying Russian fighter jets, tried everything to get them out. They fell silent, not wanting to distract Victor, as they knew they were in a crisis. They were stuck for nearly an hour, and Guillen had already prepared himself for the worst, thinking it might be the end. But luckily, the submersible eventually managed to break free, thanks to Victor's skills. It was a huge relief for Guillen, who had already accepted the possibility of not making it out alive. They had a moment of darkness and uncertainty before realizing they were floating and safe. Guillen admits that being trapped in the submersible was a terrifying experience, especially because he had a fear of water. He was concerned about anyone panicking and making a dangerous move that could jeopardize their safety. So, he stayed vigilant and ready to prevent anyone from panicking. Looking back, Guillen feels for the five people currently missing in the tourist submersible. He knows exactly what they might be going through and can't find words to express his empathy and concern. You know, Gaudi, I, I, I've had to relive it all this week and um, it's agonizing for me because I feel such a kinship to the people who lost their lives. He's praying for their safe return. Now listen to this. According to Dr. Gielen, the mere one submersible he was in during his dive to the Titanic wreck was a sturdy and reliable vessel specifically designed for serious scientific research in harsh deep sea conditions. It had a proven track record of successfully completing deep water exploration missions multiple times. The recent failed tourism trip to the Titanic resulted in the discovery of the Titan in pieces on the ocean floor. Dr. Gillen questions whether the Titan was truly seaworthy and whether it should have been permitted to undertake such a dive. The comparison between the two submersibles highlights the importance of having well-built and certified vessels for deep sea exploration. The Mir one, built for scientific purposes, had a reliable reputation, while the safety concerns surrounding the Titan raised doubts about its suitability for underwater tourism expeditions. Now, Tyson and Dr. Guillen are both in agreement that it's time to hit the brakes on expeditions to the Titanic, especially the tourist trips. They want everyone to understand that diving into the deep sea is no joke and should not be taken lightly like a trip to Disneyland. They're urging a temporary pause on future Titanic expeditions until we have a better understanding of what went wrong with the ill-fated Titan submersible. The ocean is like a ferocious beast, ready to devour anyone who makes a single mistake. So. It's better to be cautious and gather all the facts before venturing back down there. They also want to remind people that the Titanic wreckage is not just some ordinary shipwreck. It's a solemn resting place for more than a thousand souls. It deserves respect, not only for the inherent dangers involved in the mission, but also as a tribute to those who tragically perished. OceanGate has now, and finally, dropped a bombshell by suspending all exploration and commercial operations. With a bold red banner on their website, they've left us hanging without any further information about their sudden decision. And that's all we have today. What do you think about the new discoveries around OceanGate and its submersibles? Let us know in the comments.